Uh, thank you all for joining in this morning session after the conference dinner. It's good to see so many people here, here for the programming language uh, session. Uh, the first talk will be given by Vladimir, and he will be talking about the quantum expectation transformers for cost analysis. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Martin Alvanzini, Georg Moser, uh, Roma Peshu, and Simon Perdri. Okay, so the talk is about quantum programming. Now, what we need to uh, know here is that things get uh, a bit uh, complicated once we consider some of the effects that, uh, that uh, we have in place. So, in particular, in quantum programming, we have probabilistic effects because, uh, well, because of the possibility of quantum measurements, uh, what, uh, what the program actually computes is a probability distribution of uh, results. Uh, we also have quantum effects, which basically means that we, we also have to carry around uh, a quantum state uh, everywhere with us so that we can uh, extract, uh, so, that, well, so that we can actually uh, describe the program dynamics. And uh, even in uh, nice situations uh, where a, a quantum program is uh, almost surely terminating, so it means it, pro it uh, terminates with probability one, then we can end up in situations where, where there is no upper bound on the number of uh, reduction steps that uh, we perform. Uh, and in, in general, we can, we can end up uh, computing uh, infinitely many values uh, with some probability. So the probability distribution may have uh, infinite support. So here I really am talking about uh, quantum programs and not about quantum circuits. Okay, so this is something that I want to emphasize. So let's consider an example. So this is a quantum program we have here. It's, uh, I think uh, very simple. We just have a Boolean variable initialized to true. We have a qubit initialized to cat zero. And n here is an integer which uh, we set to zero at the beginning. And here we have a very simple while loop uh, condition on the Boolean variable. So what I do in the while loop is I apply a Hadamard uh, gate to Q. Then I measure the qubit. And finally, I increment uh, n by one. Now. So this is, uh, so of course, this is not uh, a quantum circuit. This is a quantum program. And now here we see that uh, the program is always going to terminate. So we terminate with probability one. Okay, that's pretty much clear, I think, because uh, uh, what's going to happen upon termination here is that the qubit variable will be uh, zero at the end, it's get zero, the Boolean variable will be false, and n will be the number of loops that uh, we have performed. And if, if you do a simple calculation, you will see that, well, yes, so I, uh, the, the natural number n here will be produced with probability 1 over 2 to the power of n. And therefore, a simple argument reveals that you will always uh, terminate. So probability of termination is 1. Uh, but of, of course, there is no upper bound on the number of uh, steps that, you, uh, this, uh, that uh, leads to this. OK, so our motivation here for the talk is uh, how can we determine the expected cost of uh, a quantum program? So to consider some examples. So the cost here sh is the, 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 the way that we talk about cost is uh, very general. So we, uh, you will see in a moment how it is introduced. But per specific examples that uh, we can handle with our analysis uh, concerns the expected runtime of a program. Uh, and so this, would, this is very similar to what we saw in the previous example, for instance. Uh, something else that we can uh, do is uh, to uh, calculate the expected number of T-gates that the quantum program would use, and even we can even allow a more general, uh, even more general cost uh, models uh, as well, depending on how the cost annotations are inserted into the program. Now, of course, this problem is uh, undecidable, so it's, I think it's uh, easy to see. And even, in, even for special cases which are decidable, uh, well, they're intractable because, you know, you have to, in general, to extract uh, the, the necessary probability information that you need in order to determine the expected uh, runtime, the expected cost. So you have to know what the quantum state is. Uh, but, of course, we're not scared, and where's the fun in uh, solving a decidable problem anyway? So let's see what we can say here. So there's uh, many special cases where we can say interesting things. So what we're going to do here is uh, static analysis. And our motivation is uh, what I just said. So how do we determine the expected cost of a quantum program? So the approach that, uh, an initial approach that we may follow is the following. So we are going to uh, describe formally a syntax for uh, a simple mixed classical quantum language. We describe its uh, operational semantics uh, as well. So this is something that uh, can be achieved. But then two problems arise. The operational semantics is uh, difficult to reason about. It's difficult to talk about. 
and uh, because of the presence of both probabilistic effects and quantum effects, in order to determine the expected run cost, we have to consider the asymptotic behavior of the uh, reduction. Okay, so we, you have to explain what happens uh, at the end of uh, upon program termination. And since we just saw that you can, uh, that the operational semantics induces uh, uh, infinite uh, probability distributions with sorry probability distributions with uh, countably infinite support. You, 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 you end up having to talk about uh, infinite sequences here, and you have to talk about infinite limits and so on. And this is a problem. So what we're going to do instead is that we're going to describe a denotational and, mat and a mathematical approach to this problem. So we're going to describe a mathematical semantics, which is sound and adequate with respect to the operational one. And then we will explain how we can avoid computing the, the limits by, uh, by introducing suitable approximations uh, uh, on the program from above. So we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, explain how this can be achieved. Okay, so here we start with uh, the syntax of our, uh, of our language. So overall it is uh, very simple. So here we have uh, arithmetic expressions. We have, uh, which are, so here x just ranges over um, uh, arithmetic uh, variables, n is an integer, we have uh, subtraction, addition and multiplication. Then we also have Boolean expressions with the, with the usual Boolean connectives, the usual constants and uh, well, usual introduction rules from the arithmetic expressions. For the program statements, we have skip, which is the program which doesn't do anything. We have next variable assignment, application of a unitary operator u, where u is uh, understood to range over some uh, uh, pre-specified uh, set of unitary operations. Q here is a set of, uh, sorry, it is a sequence of uh, qubit variables on which the unitary is applied. We support measurements where the measurement outcome is stored in a classical variable for potential re uh, reuse, like as many times as we wish. Now, finally, this is the, the key, uh, uh, the key addition here, which is the consume statement, which we, which we use in order to, uh, uh, well, in order to model the cost. So here, a here is an arithmetic expression, so you can say things like consume one, and this would uh, amount to, uh, let's say, consuming one unit of resource, and this is what you wish to count at the end. So this is something which should be understood in a meta-theoretic sense. So you can write a normal program, and then if you have some, some understood cost model, you can just write another program that would insert the cost annotations into your program. And then our, our analysis will actually uh, determine the expected cost of these consume statements. We have uh, sequencing as usual, uh, if, if statements for conditional branching, finally, while loops for general recursion. Okay, now for, for the operational semantics, uh, what, we, what we do here is uh, we, uh, we use a probabilistic abstract reduction system in order to uh, formally describe how reduction occurs uh, in this programming language. In this case, this is given by triples of the following form. Uh, STM, this is uh, well, the program statement, or this is the program which uh, remains to be executed. S is the classical store, which gives us sufficient information in order to uh, determine what is the, st the, the state of the classical variables. And finally, cat phi here is the quantum state. It's a pure, it, we, it's a pure, uh, uh, it's a pure uh, quantum system here. Uh, this uh, triple here gives us sufficient information to determine uh, everything that we need to know so that we can explain what can occur for the remainder of the execution. Now, uh, then the single step reduction relation is uh, modeled as a, as a relation between uh, program configurations, which are the triples that I just introduced above. On the left hand side, we have a program configuration. On the arrow above, we have uh, a cost annotation. So this is the potential cost which may be incurred by a single step reduction. And on the right hand side, we have a probability distribution of program configurations. Okay, so, so this can occur, for example, when we have measurement in evaluating position. In this case, of course, there could be two potential uh, outcomes. So here, we're not going to talk much about the details. I just copy-pasted uh, uh, some of the rules so we can see that there is some technicalities involved. Yeah, so if you actually wish to even formalize the single step reduction uh, relation, you have to write uh, things like this, where you make uh, where you make it very precise uh, how you have to manipulate the configuration, how you manipulate the quantum state, and blah blah blah. So we're not going to cover the notation. And this is what you have to do just for the single step reduction relation. 
But as I just uh, explained here, we're interested in determining the expected cost. So you, have to, you actually have to consider the asymptotic behavior of this uh, reduction relation. So what happens at the end when, once you consider the transitive closure and so on. And uh, here, because we have so many effects in place, we have probabilistic effects, we have quantum effects, um, we have recursion, and on top of this, we also have cost. We have four different computational effects that have been slapped on a essentially pure system. And because of this, it becomes kind of complicated. So, so to even uh, define what the expected cost uh, is here at the bottom. So this is either a, re uh, either a non-negative real number or positive infinity, which can happen, for example, when we have divergence. This actually requires some, uh, some effort to even define. But this can be achieved, and I spare you the details. But just by considering the operational semantics and talking about some limits and so on, we can determine what is the expected cost of the program. So let's consider a concrete example so you see what, what goes on. So here we have a very simple program where the, on the first line Q, this notation here indicates that Q is an arbitrary variable. So we don't know, so it's a qubit and we do not know what is the state of the qubit. X is a Boolean variable initialized to true. Then we perform a while loop where X is the uh, guard. So we enter the while loop. Then here we perform a Hadamard gate on the only qubit variable we have. We measure it and then we consume one unit of uh, resources. So in this case, the expected cost in this case is just going to be the expected number of while loops that the program is going to perform. Uh, all right, so in this case, the cost is very simple. But in general, we can have more complicated costs. So here, what is the expected uh, number of while loops that we will perform? Uh, so first, again, this is not, not uh, a bad case because the, pro the, the program will always terminate. So again, a simple argument reveals that this will be the case. And now we can observe that uh, if the initial state of the qubit is uh, plus, then, OK, then we know exactly what's going to happen. Then you perform exactly one iteration, and you just quit. So this is easy to see. In all other cases, what you're going to do is you're going to perform a biased coin toss on the, on the first iteration, and then subsequently you start doing fair coin tosses. So here we're using quantum resources in a very simple way. Okay. And, uh, well, we see that depending on what is the initial state of the qubit, so in this case, uh, let's say it's, uh, it's uh, this is the state, so this uh, alpha and beta, of course, that's by the usual normalization condition. Then it follows that the expected number of while loops will be this this uh, number here. So in particular, we see that the highest possible expectation is when the state is in the minus state, and then the expected number of while loops will be three. But of course, this is just the expectation. So this is you know the what will happen once you consider all possible uh, uh, reduction paths, and then you normalize with respect to the uh, associated probabilities. Okay, but now we see that. It's, it's kind of complicated to uh, talk about this. So we wish to introduce, so we wish to stop talking about the operational semantics and we wish to do something which we consider to be more manageable. So what we're going to do is we're going to adopt a mathematical and also a denotational approach to this problem. So now, what do we know from denotational semantics? Like, let's say you're a, you know, you're a little computer scientist, you've never done a denotational semantics for a quantum programming language. This is your first time. What are, you, what are you going to do? Well, uh, well, probably the first thing you do is like read some papers, but even if you don't, uh, there, there, there are some things that uh, you would expect. So what you want to do here is to first uh, come up with a suitable semantic domain. Uh, so now to keep things simple, let's say that we don't have any consume statements because this is a computational effect that makes things uh, hard for us. So let's say there is no consume statements, and to make it even simpler, let's say we only have quantum information. We, we drop the classical variables and so on. In that case, a suitable semantic domain is to just take the sub-density matrices. So you take the space of density matrices over some understood Hilbert space that describes the potential uh, states of your quantum variables. And by sub-density matrix, I mean a density matrix, except that the trace can be at most one. Okay? In this case, you have the structure of a CPO, which is a complete partial order. And you also have uh, a convex structure, which means that you can take uh, convex sums of uh, density matrices. Uh, and uh, overall, of course, you have some additional structure, but this suffices for you to perform a nice uh, interpretation, which takes the following form. Uh, the semantic function is written uh, in this notation as usual. In this case, you take a pro uh, you, it takes a pair, which is a program, and a state. 
By state here, I mean a mixed classical quantum state. Okay, so in particular, it will be essentially you can view it as a density matrix parameterized by some classical by some additional function from a classical space into the uh, space of density matrices. Uh, sorry, into a suitable Hilbert space because here we talk about the uh, just the variables. So, so yes, it will be into a Hilbert space. Uh, and then the semantic domain. Okay, this is. The, so here you have to be careful if you introduce classical variables, but with the quantum ones, you just take sub-density matrices. And then what you can do is that you can have, uh, if you define your semantics carefully, then you will be able to prove that this equation here holds. But now the key point is that you do not want this equation here to be the definition. Because if you do it uh, like this, then here this reduction relation comes from the operational semantics. And it means that you will define your semantic interpretation in terms of the operational semantics, which is what we want to avoid, because you know the operational semantics is very complicated and you have to talk about limits and so on. So instead you just define it by induction on, on, the, on the structure of your program. And then if you start doing some work and you prove some theorems and so on, at the end you will be able to prove that the semantic interpretation of your program together with the initial state in which your variables are, is equal to the potentially infinite uh, convex sum of the final states that your program can reduce to. Where, of course, there, um, uh, well, here, the, 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 the probability uh, coefficients are determined by the overall reduction probability from the operational semantics. Okay, and here we will also say that this is the expected value of the interpretation function uh, on, uh, on the program uh, STM when evaluated at the initial state sigma, which describes the initial state of all the variables. Okay, so you do some work, you can prove this. Now, in order to prepare for the more uh, sophisticated interpretation that we need in order to, to uh, interpret the, the remaining computational effect, now we can observe that by currying the semantic function, we can see this as, uh, as, uh, as a function from programs to the function space from states into our semantic uh, domain. Uh, the semantic domain S for now, we can keep it abstract. I do it on purpose. At the end, we'll see what is a suitable one. Okay, what do we do with the cost? Okay, it's the final computational effect that we have not explained how to, 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 how to handle. Well, here, so this is kind of a big jump, but now the main idea is to use continuation passing style semantics. So what does this mean? It, it means that from now on, we're not going to be talking just about data. We'll be talking about functions that uh, accept data, manipulate it, and return something else, potentially a function. Uh, so this is an idea which comes from functional programming, but it also has been studied by category theorists. It's been a very fruitful idea. And also, this is, uh, this is something that the classical probabilistic programming people use to deal with the, uh, with the analogous problem in, uh, in their field as well. So, so, okay, so this now gets a bit more complicated. So let's say here we have a semantic domain S as before, but now, you know, before I didn't tell you what it is, but here let's say it's similar. Now you can, perf now you can introduce a semantics in the following way. So first, in the first argument here, you have the program as before. Now in the second argument here, you have a function which tells you how to interpret states into your semantic domain. But it only interprets states, it doesn't interpret the program, okay? And usually the interpretation of a state is kind of obvious. Now, this function here which you pass is called the continuation. It's going to tell you essentially what do you do at the end once you have uh, now determined what is the overall probability uh, distribution determ uh, determined by the operational semantics. Then here, the, the, the output will be a function, again from states into your semantic domain, except that this function will now tell you how to recover the expected value of the continuation uh, uh, on the on the program, okay. So uh, this is explained by this equation here. So so in particular, this is what we want. So this is not how we define it. But since well, it's not our first time at the rodeo. Yeah, we've done semantics before. We can you know by doing some nice things, we can ensure that this uh, equation holds and we can prove it. Okay. So what's going on here is that again you're going to prove that. Uh, your semantic interpretation again has the, the similar form. So it is an infinite, potentially infinite convex sum of the, 
whatever is the interpretation of the final states determined by the continuation, where here, again, the, the probability coefficients are determined by the overall reduction probability from the operation of semantics. And now here, to, to determine this here, there is another infinity in general, you know, because you know, I, I already explained that this uh, requires an infinite uh, computation as well. Okay, but now what we have done is nice because we have now generalized the previous semantics. Why? Because here you can observe that if you take the continuation f to be, the, to your, to be your semantic function from, from before, then you get exactly the same thing. Okay, so as a special case, you can recover the usual denotation of semantics. But now what we have gained is a little bit more generality because we have more choice for what the continuation f will be and also for the choice of our semantic domain as well. Okay, so the overall semantic solution is now recovered in the following way. So for the semantic domain, we're just going to choose the non-negative real numbers uh, together with the freely added uh, top element, uh, which we call positive infinity. Uh, but the, the overall structure is the same as what we had on the previous slide. But now what we're going to do here is that we can, uh, we're going to introduce the expected cost in our semantics uh, as well. So our intention now is to define the semantics in such a way such that the, the semantic interpretation is now equal to the sum of the expected value. This is what we had before from the, den from the denotation of semantics and also from the previous uh, semantics on the previous slide, except that now we also take into account the expected cost of the program. And now observe that if, uh, as a special case, you set the continuation to be the function that sets everything to zero, well, then you get rid of uh, the interpretation of the final states, since you don't care, and then you get exactly the expected cost. And this makes sense because the expected cost has already been, been incurred and the, the continuation is essentially irrelevant. Okay, now the question is, of course, can we do this? So, I mean, this is just our intention here, but can we achieve it? Well, yeah, because otherwise, I mean, I mean, I don't have much time to, to waste here, so yeah, we can. Okay, and now here again, I copy-pasted the, the definition. We're not going to cover it, but the main idea is that in your semantic... Uh, uh, so here in your, uh, in your semantics, what you're doing is in the first argument, you have, uh, it, it's defined by induction of the structure of your program. The second argument is always F. This is just the continuation, which on purpose is treated abstractly. It's not specified. And then on the right-hand side, you, you return a modified function. Okay, so what you're doing here is you're playing around with functions. You take a function as an input, ret you return a function as an output. But of course, you have to be careful how you, how you manipulate it, but we do it. And then, so this is a purely uh, uh, denotational, purely mathematical definition, completely independent of the operational semantics, which we wanted to achieve. And then if you spend uh, some time uh, proving things uh, on several pages, blah, 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 you can prove this uh, theorem here, which tells you uh, that our intention on the previous slide is uh, indeed, uh, can, I, can indeed be satisfied. So as a special case, we can recover the expected cost. And now I, uh, you should recall that the expected cost, this is defined uh, purely operationally, where here we do talk about limits uh, and infinite, comp uh, we, we do, we, here we do talk about infinite limits, which are induced by the operational semantics, whereas on the left-hand side, we have our mathematical semantics. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, this is undecidable. So, so in order to determine this, of course, you grab a pen and paper, you can prove that this is true, but you cannot write a program that will compute uh, either, uh, either two of these uh, uh, values in general. So the problem is undecidable. It cannot be achieved by an algorithm. And the reason here is that technically here in the least fixed point, we also perform an infinite computation as well. This is the least fixed point of an infinite sequence here. But what is the advantage of uh, our approach? So as I mentioned, uh, well, here you can, in principle, avoid infinite computation, you can avoid talking about infinite limits if you are willing to accept uh, approximating the expected cost from above. So that is instead of computing the, the, the least upper bound here, sorry, the least upper bound is basically given here in the while loop, you can just compute an upper bound and then you can say that the expected cost of your program is uh, basically a little bit, uh, so it, it's, it's below an upper bound, so it, it, it's not going to be as precise as uh, as, as perfectly possible. But then if, you, if you're willing to accept this compromise, this is something that you can in principle compute. Why? Because here, in a, the advantages of our semantic uh, solution is that it's easier to talk about, it's easier to reason about, it's compositional, 
And due to this uh, observation here uh, about uh, least upper bounds, you can actually avoid uh, computing this uh, uh, infinite limit, which is inherent in the definition of this uh, statement here, provided that the conditions on the left-hand side are satisfied. But the conditions on the left-hand side, you should observe, now do not depend on a while loop anymore. And therefore, you can, you can avoid talking about uh, infinities. So you can avoid talking about infinite sequences. Okay, so if you're willing to accept an approximation, then this is good. And actually, this is uh, what can serve as a foundation for future static analysis tools. This is, for example, what the uh, probabilistic uh, programming people and the people who are doing uh, expected cost analysis for classical probabilistic programs are doing. And this can be automated in a certain sense, uh, where the hard part is to actually guess the upper invariant G here. So this function G you have to either guess or synthesize in a smart way, but they have figured out some nice methods for doing this, and they are able to handle some uh, uh, special cases. So, of course, you cannot handle... Yeah, yeah. So that's my final slide, yeah. So we're going to present this at uh, Lix in uh, early August, where we have 12 minutes, and I'm already talking 25, so this will be hard. Yeah, so in the paper we have more examples which are non-trivial, such as uh, quantum random walks, uh, repeat until success algorithms. So here I only presented some you know, very simple examples, but there we have uh, more sophisticated ones. In particular, the random walk is difficult uh, to analyze. Uh, and yeah, to summarize, to, to compute the, ex the, the expected uh, resource usage of a quantum program, this is an undecidable problem. However, special cases can be handled, and I think I uh, outlined uh, how it can be achieved. And uh, yeah, so the semantic solution, uh, the one based on the notation of semantics and the mathematical semantics, has uh, several important advantages over the operational ones, which can serve as a foundation for uh, static analysis and uh, automation. So thank you for your attention. Can you say anything about the cost of approximating the, the solution for a fixed point in terms of... I mean the overall complexity and so on? Yeah, if I want to get epsilon close to the real thing, can I say anything about how much that's going to... Uh, overall, it's, uh, overall, it's pretty bad. Um, I mean, even, even in the classical probabilistic case, I think it's uh, very difficult. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, I mean, so, you know, talking about complexity is hard because the problem is undecidable, right? But what happens in practice is that you, uh, you, you, you still have to, um, well, okay. Uh, what the classical probabilistic people is, uh, are doing is that they use some symbolic methods in order to model the problem. And then they use some external tools. I think uh, it, they were uh, uh, SMT solvers and so on uh, that, uh, that are able to uh, help them uh, deal with, uh, well, they're, they're able to help them deal with uh, finding solutions for, for, for the G here. Now, in the, and, oh, uh, even there, it is hard because the more variables you have, I mean, the harder it becomes. And in the, in the quantum case, you end up with way more variables. So here you would be able to handle even smaller uh, programs if you wish to automate this. So overall, I can say that you'll be able to handle simple recursive patterns with uh, not that many variables. I think maybe set up while we do um, one more quick question. Uh, uh, do, you, do you foresee any difference in finding the G, uh, the, the G in your condition that you need to exhibit uh, uh, compared to, classical, to, to the classical probabilistic setting? Like, is it the same technique? Uh, I, uh, so, so basically what they do there is that they have analyzed uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh, recursive patterns and they, they have... Uh, uh, they have uh, like uh, a predetermined set of G's, okay? So the, the, the G's, you know, the functions that they, that they uh, have there, they have uh, some specific shape usually, which is, kind of, uh, which is kind of simple. And then they just like tweak some of the, they basically search for some of the parameters of, of these functions. Now in the quantum case, I think if you wish to do it, then you have to figure out what, uh, what nice G's are and then introduce them and then, you know, figure out, uh, then basically use like the, the similar tools in order to tweak the parameters and so on. So you have to, you still have to discover what are the good shapes. Okay. All right, let's thank Vladimir again.
Right, so our next speaker is Finn Wojciak. Am I pronouncing that? Yeah. Right, okay. Who will be talking about QUnity, a new programming languages? Unity, yes. Unity. Yeah. <laughs> You'll talk about Unity. Okay, wait. All right. Yeah, so I'm yeah. this is a unified language for quantum and classical computing. Um, I'm going to start off with a simple example that you're probably familiar with, Deutsch's algorithm. And this is a problem, it's an oracle problem. It uses a reversible subroutine for a classical function. This is kind of an assumption of Deutsch's algorithm that this uh, reversible subroutine can be constructed. And if you look at the implementation of Deutsch's algorithm on the left, the circuit, it looks a little bit different than, I guess, potentially the most convenient way to analyze the algorithm on the right, which involves this conditional phase flip. And so one of our goals is to bridge this gap between implementation and analysis. So at the bottom is Deutsch's algorithm written in QNity. Um, it's a function of um, this subprogram F. And the idea is that uh, it's it, it uses this coherent control, this control operator. So it's saying controlled on the value of f of x, it either outputs x or x modified by a global phase. Um, and one other interesting thing is that this subprogram f can be implemented via an arbitrary quantum algorithm. And what I mean by that is that it can involve things like measurement and decoherence. Um, this is kind of unusual because Deutsch's algorithm assumes that this use of f it already exists that's completely reversible and coherent, and we are, um, but in practice, uh, you'll want this to be, in, in practice, you'll want to be able to construct these reversible oracles from irreversible quantum algorithms. This is kind of a common thing that quantum algorithm designers do is they assume that if we have an algorithm for computing um, if we have a, a hybrid quantum classical algorithm that goes from X to F of X, then you can convert that into a coherent reversible oracle um, that goes from X and Y to X and Y, X or F of X. Um, but existing language in existing languages, this kind of reversible oracle, um, it requires uncomputation of garbage and it's kind of um, clunky and error prone to do in existing languages. And the main reason that this is difficult in existing languages is that they're um, focused on the QRAM model, the quantum random access machine, which kind of assumes a strict separation between quantum and classical systems. Um, so each system has its own data types and you have to have kind of explicit communication between the two with like a, a measurement operator or something. Um, in our view, we're treating quantum computing as a generalization of classical computing with a unified type system and implicit interoperability between the two. Uh, and so the rest of this talk, I'll go through Kennedy's design principles. I would summarize it by these four, generalization of classical constructs, expressiveness, compositionality, and realizability. So generalization of classical constructs. This is QNity's type system. Um, we, it's uh, similar to what you might see in a, a classical language with algebraic data types. Um, but I guess in this case, we're treating the sum and product as the direct sum of Hilbert spaces and the tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Um, the, here we're defining the bit type in terms of these other types. So it's unit plus unit here. Uh, and but this bit type is used both for classical bits and for qubits. Um, it's one type system for both. Uh, the the one the, the distinction that we do make is between pure and impure computation, um, or coherent versus decoherence. Um, here's Kennedy's base syntax. It uses a lot of familiar classical constructs. Um, so one thing I want to note is that this is a mutually inductive definition. So it, it is a, it is a fun, it is a functional language in that the semantics will be a function, but, um, it does not have higher order functions. Um, yeah. So the, the values in this language are 
similar to what you'd see in a classical language with pairs and left and right constructors. Although, again, we're dealing with tensor products and direct sums rather than classical sums and products. Uh, we also use pattern matching. So in this case, we're using pattern matching to implement a kind of projective map. Um, and then we also have a, a, a try catch statement, which is we're kind of generalizing the idea of exception handling from classical to a um, projective measurement. And I'll explain that a little more concretely. Uh, here's an example program where we define the zero and one bits in terms of left and right. We can define this proj zero operator, um, which is the projector onto the zero qubit, um, and it's lambda zero arrow zero. So I want to note that we allow for not this is not this is not a unitary operator. It's it's norm decreasing, not norm preserving, um, which we allow. I'll explain that a little more later. Um, but this this proj zero has this this semantics, and if we wrap it in a try catch block, then we're essentially trying to project onto the zero space and catching by returning one instead. And so the semantics is uh, a projective measurement in the standard basis. The control expression uses uh, some pattern matching to enable for to enable quantum control. So here's a, a simple example of a, a C not gate. Um, here we're implementing the not gate in terms of this U3 parameterization. And then the C not gate is a matter of controlling on X and outputting either Y or not Y, depending on um, I get it. yeah, depending on what X is, but this is this is not a measuring operation. This is uh, this is coherent control. Uh, yeah, so next, talk a little bit about expressiveness. A lot of CUNITY's expressiveness comes from its use of algebraic data types. So this is an example that we talked about in our paper from, it's a, it's a quantum walk algorithm that uh, is nice. It's a nice example because it's implemented in Quipper, um, but it requires coherently manipulating these tree vertex indices. And so what you, you and I guess you need superpositions of these tree vertex indices. So if we have this big tree, you need to figure out some bit string rep in if in the, the Quipper implementation of this algorithm, you need to figure out some bit string representation for each of these um, each of these tree vertices, and then figure out how to coherently do these um, operations that you need to do on these tree vertex indices because Quipper does not have algebraic data types. But these tree vertex indices are much more conveniently represented as a variable length list of bits. So in this case, I'm using the, the list of directions taken from the root of the tree with zero being left and one being right. Um, but to, to do this, you need to be able to represent a superposition of two lists of different lengths of qubits. And this is something that you can't really do without algebraic data types. Um, but in our language, you can define this vertex type as a, as a direct sum, and it's um, convenient to have these variable length lists. Next, compositionality. This is an admittedly vague term, and so we kind of mean it in two different senses. Um, both the, the first sense that we mean compositionality is that our denotational semantics is compositional. This seems like it should go without saying, but there have been a few quantum programming languages recently that have a non-compositional denotational semantics, which leads to problems because then you can prove programs equivalent, but not be able to substitute them for each other. Um, so yeah, so this is an example of the semantics of the Lambda terms. And so we have this T, this is the T pure abs typing rule for these Lambda terms. And we're typing this Lambda E arrow E prime. And so it's the, the semantics of this Lambda is constructed from the semantics of the subterms. So the semantics of E and the semantics of E prime. And so by composing them with a little adjoint, uh, it's kind of straightforward to go from the T input type 
to this intermediate context gamma to the output T prime type. Now, one thing that's, uh, the, the other sense of compositionality is that we can, Unity allows programs to be composed in useful ways. And in particular, we can construct pure operators from mixed super operators. So if we suppose that you can implement this probabilistic impure program that goes from a, a trip to a bit, you can use this program as a condition for coherently flipping a bit. So this is a lot like the CNOT example controlled on f of x, outputting either y or not y. Now, but this is a little bit weird because if it's probabilistic, it's, it's kind of ill-defined um, in general how, how to do this um, uncomputation of garbage. And so we have to define it precisely. Um, so here's an example where if that original program F is described by, this is a classical stochastic transition matrix. So this is not, a, not, a, not, not anything quantum. Um, and so here the, the two thirds means that um, given the Q, given the, the trit input C, it'll output the bit with the, the bit zero with probability two thirds. Then the coherently conditional bit flip is described by this norm decreasing operator and the two thirds becomes this amplitude in this matrix. So we're kind of, we're doing something weird converting from probabilities directly to amplitudes. And what that means is that you end up with a norm decreasing op as the probability of error and this error is already um, kind of, you can already handle it with the try catch operator and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and so this is norm decreasing because this, this column is not um, norm one. Next, realizability. So in our paper, we talk about the syntax type system, denotational semantics, and a compilation strategy. The version that's on archive now um, doesn't have the full compiler. We plan to um, host a new version with, in about a week or so, but which will have the full compiler. Um, but the basic idea is that our semantics are in terms of these norm decreasing operators that have a different input and output space. And we compile that into a qubit based unitary by adding these um, additional prep wires and flag wires. The prep wires are ones that are initialized to zero and the flag wires are ones that are zero unless there's an error. They kind of are an, an indicator of whether there was error and thus norm decrease. So yeah, in summary, um, four principles, generalization of classical computing, expressivity, and realizability. And so if you want, the, there's going to be a more, the version on archive has a lot of conjectures. There's going to be a more complete version soon. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, what is the uh, elimination rule for pair types? Maybe I didn't see it uh, in your syntax. Um, uh, that's my first question. And the second one, so for the uh, for the last construct there, where you're, uh, can you show the matrix against them? Yeah, so how do you do this in the operational semantics? Is it the same or? Um, so, we, we don't, so we don't actually have, I mean, we, we have a denotational semantics and a compiler and a proof that the compiler implements the denotational semantics. So I guess if you view the compiler as the operational semantics, then we have an operational semantics, but not a formal operational semantics. Um, I guess to, to answer your question, um, the, the way that we do this is through kind of standard on computation of garbage, there there are languages like Silk that kind of have this safe automatic uncomputation built in. Silk has the restriction that the thing that you're uncomputing has to be classical, and so 
we allow for it to not be classical, but as a result, um, we end up um, basically in, in the case where you do something that's not classical, you'll end up with the, the flag wires. Um, be, it, we, we designed the compiler so that in that case, the, the flag wires will end up having a non-zero probability of being one, which just means that it's impossible to do without some probability of error, but there are theorems for bounding that error. Oh, yeah. So I guess we, we have the syntax, right? I don't have the full typing rules in this slide. Okay. Let's do uh, one more quick question while the next speaker uh, sets up there. Thank you. So in your talk, you mentioned that Kubert does not have algebra in data type. Uh, can you clarify that? I, okay, yeah. So Quipper, I guess Quipper does have classical algebraic data types, but I mean, that there's not, I guess, given, I, I mean, so you can, in Quipper, you can construct like a, you can have a qubit type and you can have a pair of qubits type. You can't have, you can't combine those to create a, well, yeah, so a, a, I guess a qubit type would have, would be two dimensional, a pair of qubits would be four dimensional. Um, the direct sum of those would be um, a six dimensional Hilbert space. Um, and that's not really something that you can, um, can do in Quipper. All right, let's thank our speaker again. And then for the final talk in the session, we have Tobias Stolomirev, who will be talking about diagrammatic analysis for parameterized quantum circuits. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Tobias Stolomirev, and I'm leading a quantum computing or quantum algorithm group uh, at the German Aerospace Center in Cologne. But soon the group will uh, move to the Ulich Research Center, which is also close by. Um, the work has been done in collaboration with uh, Stuart Hetfield from the um, NASA Quantum Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And uh, the motivation for our work was that we wanted to um, apply the ZX calculus for uh, parameterized quantum circuits or uh, more specific to variational quantum circuits or even more specific to QAA. way. Um, so in parameterized quantum circuits, you, um, this is a very um, active research area with many open problems. Um, we already heard something about that in the uh, session one, the parallel session one. So for example, um, the performance of a given ansatz or given problem instance is, is unclear. Uh, it's uh, unclear how to find good parameters uh, for your variational ansatz, uh, and the choice of the ansatz is also uh, not not clear if you have a given problem. Um, the applications uh, vary from combinatorial optimization to machine learning or quantum chemistry, uh, among other things. And our focus was uh, that we wanted to look at expectation values for parameterized quantum circuits. Um, for example, for a QAA algorithm that you can see here, the gammas and the betas are the parameters. Um, so you get a parameterized state, and this is the expectation value for some uh, operator C. And it turns out uh, that in order to uh, calculate these expectation values as an analytical formula of these parameters, we needed to extend uh, the standard ZX calculus towards uh, linear combination. Uh, of course, this has a lot of um, relation to the talks in the in the session that I mentioned before. Um, so what we did uh, is shown here. So here you can see a linear combination of diagrams. So these boxes are placeholders for ZX diagrams with M inputs and N outputs. And the small a and small b are complex scalar factors. And uh, here you just have two summons. Um, so um, the, the diagram for the linear combination now looks like this. So each summon is written in, in these bubbles and uh, um, the scalar factor is written on a line. Uh, and then you have these strange new symbols which always come in pairs. So you branch off, so to say, and then you uh, combine it here. So you always have two of these summation symbols. 
Um, and it turns out that uh, we need two rules to uh, incorporate these new diagrams into the ZX calculus. The first one uh, is the diagram pull rule. So here you can see again these boxes, they are placeholders for ZX diagrams. Um, and one of the diagram is now a linear combination diagram with two uh, bubbles. And what we can do then is actually pull in and pull out the surrounding diagrams, as you can see here. So now all, everything is pulled in on the right hand side. Um, and the other rule we needed uh, is the product or composition rule for the linear combination diagram. So here you have uh, two, uh, a composition of two of these linear co um, combination diagrams with two summons each. Uh, so you end up with uh, a linear combination diagram with four summons. So um, let's look uh, at uh, how this uh, looks in practice. So this is an example, a single qubit rotation. So here you just have e to the i gamma z. Um, and you can write that as a linear combination of uh, cosine times the identity plus uh, a sine times a z term. Um, and of course, you can also write that as um, um, a zx um, z spider. Here we subscribe to the um, white and uh, gray notation. So this is a z spider here. Um, and you can write this uh, as a linear combination diagram where the first summand uh, is uh, in the top bubble. So this is just the identity. And the second one is in the bottom bubble where you have just this pi z spider and the coefficients are now on the line. Um, you can do the same for the x rotation, which looks like that. Or, um, and this will become important, for example, uh, you have uh, a two qubit rotation. So you have this typical face gadgets that you get in these uh, parameterized quantum circuits, for example, in QAOA. Um, they look like this in, in standard ZX calculus. Uh, but you can write them as a linear combination diagram um, in terms of these uh, elementary Pauli operations um, like this. So you have uh, in the top bubble, you have two identities and here you have two Z terms. Um, so I would like to demonstrate uh, how this works on a very simple example. Um, so here uh, we look at the QAOA algorithm. So it, that's an algorithm for finding, um, for example, the maximum cut of this graph. So we have just four uh, vertices and we want to find the maximum cut. So we can write down a cost Hamiltonian, uh, which we seek to minimize in order to find the maximum cut. Uh, and here you have these ZZ terms whenever you have an edge in this graph. And uh, now the QAA works as follows. You start with an initial state, and then uh, you have these layers, um, which uh, have, there are two types. The first one is uh, coming from the cost Hamiltonian, and the second one from the um, uh, is so-called so mixing Hamiltonian. In our case, these are just uh, X terms. Uh, and uh, we also restrict ourselves to um, only two layers here. So our ansatz looks like that. We have now this uh, cost function unitary and the mixing unitary here. Um, and our goal is then to minimize the expectation value. And what we want to do here is um, write down the expectation value as um, an analytical formula, which depends on, on, then on these parameters gamma and beta. And you can see here that the um, expectation value is comprised uh, only uh, of um, expectation values of these ZZ terms. So let's look at one of these ZZ terms for uh, demonstration purposes. So if you write, uh, for example, Z2, Z3 um, as a ZX diagram, you get the states and the effects on the uh, left and right hand side then you get this term uh, stemming from the cost function. And here you can nicely see that uh, the structure with these phase gadgets here rep, um, uh, reflects the, the structure of the original problem graph. And then you also have um, these mixing Hamiltonians with the um, X spiders here. Uh, then you have the Z spiders in the middle, the Z2 and Z3. And then you have the conjugated part here. So uh, let's, let's try to uh, contract this diagram now. So first uh, we apply standard uh, ZX rules and we end up with something like this. So, and at this point, 
uh, we could not go uh, further and contract it further with the standard ZX. So uh, what we did now is to replace these two uh, X spiders here with uh, linear, uh, linear combination diagrams. So this looks like that. And then uh, we, uh, um, we combine these two diagrams into a single linear combination diagram with uh, this composition rule. And then we have uh, four uh, bubbles here. So we have four contributions in our linear combination diagram um, with various factors. And what we then do is then we pull in all the surroundings of this uh, diagram um, with this um, diagram pull rule. And we have something like this. So now we have a single linear combination diagram. And uh, in order to go further, we have to look at each of these bubbles individually. Let's just look at this one. Um, so here again, we apply standard ZX rules and uh, end up uh, with phase gadgets that we cannot further contract. Uh, so uh, again, we replace these phase gadgets with the linear combination uh, diagram. And if we do that, it looks more ugly at the beginning, but actually um, it, this helps us. So here we have now two of these linear combination diagrams, and now we can pull in the states and the effects um, so we get something like this. Uh, and you can originally, now you can see that some of the contributions will vanish. For example, this one will vanish because you have a pie and an empty spider. And also um, uh, this and this one will vanish. So we will end up with just one uh, contribution. And then you can uh, calculate that further. You have your result. You do the same for all uh, four of these terms, and then you get the final result. So uh, let me summarize. Um, so we have extended the uh, ZX calculus towards linear combination diagrams um, for the analysis of parameterized quantum circuits. Um, our main application was uh, QAOA and uh, other variational quantum circuits, but mostly uh, for combinatorial optimization. Um, and in our paper, we also present uh, various other uh, applications uh, for examples. Future work uh, um, would include that uh, it would be interesting to see to what degree these di diagrammatic methods uh, could help resolve many of these open problems in uh, parameterized quantum circuits, like computing gradients, the um, uh, parameter setting or performance analysis. Um, and of course, it would be interesting to investigate applications beyond combinatorial optimization, like uh, quantum chemistry. Um, and of course, we, as I already mentioned, there's a lot of related work uh, that we saw on Wednesday, uh, and it would be uh, super interesting to combine uh, our results with this work. And finally, uh, we hope to um, get better ansatz designs from uh, using these diagrammatic methods. Thank you. Right, Douglas, thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Okay. Thanks, uh, that was very cool things. If I understood correctly, you can use this technique to split any non Clifford spider into some of Clifford spiders. Is that right? I think so, yes. Okay. And the number of summons in general would be two to the number of times you speak. Yeah, that's the drawback. Okay. No free lunch. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, oh, thank you for your talk. Um, so I I was wondering, have you done maybe something similar in trying to uh, investigate the problem of over-parameterization in these like QAOA type of things? Because like you can try and contract them and see if uh, parameters merge together or something like that. I know that people have been doing that. I haven't done that in, in person, yeah, but of course, yeah. Um, oh, Elliot, I also have a question. Um, I'll get to you. Um, have you thought about the categorical interpretation of these summons or these sum and sort of reverse sum boxes? Or as uh, yeah, relatively, uh, how would you implement this in software? So 
um, we are we are starting to do that. I have a master's student who's looking in, into exactly that to how to. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a very like practical idea right now, and we would like to uh, substantiate this with more uh, theory, in, um, in particular in this direction of category theory. Um, and we are also in contact with some people from Continuum um, to implement that in, in DiscoPipe, for example. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, so you decompose your unitary into sums of unitary transformations, so the mm -hmm. identity and the Pauli transformations. So did you look at the uh, decomposition in terms of sum of projectors, for instance? Because no, maybe it's, uh, not yet, no. Simpler than to propagate, the, to simplify the diagrams. I haven't done that yet, but it's interesting. Okay, thanks. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.